Hi, welcome to Meds One, and this is the first edition of How to Save a Life. I'm here with uh, Jim Descharmes, clinical supervisor and uh, coordinator of our education department. I'm Tim George, I'm com community paramedic and also uh, the director of EMS and community health outreach. Uh, we're going to present uh, six different episodes during the next year on concepts and as well as skills related to how to save a life how to save a life of a human, how to save a life of your dog, how to save a life in the community of people that may come to you with uh, problems such as uh, suicidal intent. So we have a, a lot of different things we'll be covering through this year. We're going to start today with uh, Jim. Jim is uh, going to be covering some skills, and I believe you're going to be covering skills such as an AED, yes. automatic external defibrillator, and what mm -hmm. else? Uh, and the use of uh, EpiPen, and uh, how to open an airway. So, yeah. Okay, Jim, you come to EMS a little bit differently than a lot of people do in, uh, as far as careers. You had a mid-career change. Tell us about that. I did. Um, I started out in, in engineering, and um, I was in that field for approximately 17 years. And um, kind of due to an economic downturn, I decided to change careers. Um, and, I, and I, I became an EMT at that point and uh, eventually then went back to school and got my paramedic. Um, people kind of asked me, you know, why, why this field, How's, was it a tough transition? And actually it wasn't. It's um, designing things is very similar to, to working on people. You know, the problem solving aspect of it is very similar. And uh, I grew up in a family of firefighters, so I always kind of had this this uh, dream of sometime being being a, a firefighter, like you know, a lot of kids do. And um, you know, my my brother was a fireman, my father was a fireman, my grandfather was a fireman, and, and I went this other direction. So I saw an opportunity to to give it a try. So I ended up uh, switching careers uh, uh, at the last uh, economic downturn, and um, just fell in love with it. Came here to Meds One and took my EMT class. And after I finished my EMT, I uh, was hired on here at, at uh, Meds One as an EMT. I worked full time and taught at that time uh, for about a year. After a year, I, I was converted. I, I loved the field so much that I decided to make it a permanent thing. So I went back to school and got my paramedic. Um, after I got my paramedic, then uh, I continued working here at Meds One full time, and I took over the education coordinator position. So, and it, I can, um, it's a very interesting field for me. It's every day is very different, and I absolutely love my job. I'm excited to go to work every day, and uh, you don't get to do that too often throughout your life. So. So these three things that we're going to be looking at today, the use of an EpiPen, an automated external defibrillator, and also how to just open an airway with someone that's collapsed, someone who's unconscious. <coughs> these are things that we generally teach in a first aid class. And we do know from the national uh, data that we have that probably one in 10 Americans actually take formal first aid training. And so this is why we really want to look at these three things that we know of. And as a matter of fact, these are the three things that you can actually do to really, if you want to think about being being a hero, really being a hero when we do this. You're also going to hear some uh, background noise around here. Uh, we're, this is the beginning of our day, and the crews right now are getting ready. So we're in the ambulance garage at the ambulance base in, in Grand Rapids. So if you hear some of this background noise, sirens, etc., this is where most of our episodes will be filmed. In the first, of, uh, the first part of our How to Save a Life, we're going to talk about opening an airway. Our airway is uh, very important in our patients. Uh, when we can control their airway, we can help control how they breathe. If they have any kind of obstruction in their airway, obviously they're going to have difficulty breathing or not be able to breathe. So when it comes to airway issues, uh, we're, we're mainly concerned with our patients who are unresponsive or partially responsive. Um, these patients could could potentially create an airway obstruction and uh, then potentially stop breathing. So um, American Heart Association has a standard and uh, there are basically two different ways of opening an airway. Uh, the first is called a head tilt chin lift and the other one is called a jaw thrust. And, and when we do these maneuvers, I'm going to show you in a moment here, it's, the, it's we can have many different things 
cause airway obstructions. Uh, one could be the tongue. The tongue is actually our most common airway obstruction. And it, what happens is when a person goes unresponsive, the muscles relax and, and the tongue can just relax and fall back into the airway and occlude it very easily. And sometimes this is all it takes to uh, cause a person to uh, stop breathing. So uh, other things could be like vomit and secretions or even to, uh, objects like broken teeth and things like that or dentures that can also fall back into the airway and, and cause it to occlude also. So <clears throat> when we're looking at, at our patient, ideally if they were laying down, it makes it much easier to open their airway. Uh, so in the case here, I have my, uh, my mannequin that we're going to use today. Um, we call him Lorenzo. <laughs> so uh, our buddy Lorenzo here, he, he takes a beating because we do all our practice on him. So, so <clears throat> I've got Lorenzo here and he's unresponsive and, uh, and he's having difficulty breathing. So the, the two different methods I talked about, the head tilt, chin lift, and the jaw thrust, are used at different times. So the head tilt chin lift is something we can do for a medical patient, somebody who does not have, has not been involved in a trauma, basically. So when we're gonna do this maneuver, we are just simply gonna, gonna put our hand on the forehead and our, and our fingers under the chin, and we can just simply um, tilt the head back a little bit. And we gotta be careful we don't move it too far. We're just gonna move it a couple of degrees. We're almost putting the patient kind of in a sniffing position. They go from this position to about that position and that's about it. So, um, so we'll just simply give his head a little bit of a tilt, kind of lifting at the chin and pushing down on the, on the forehead. And this will pull that tongue forward up out of the, out of the airway. At this time now we can, we can open the mouth and look inside and see if there's anything in there that could be occluding this airway too. So. Uh, vomit, secretions, broke off teeth, you know, other objects and things like that, like dentures. Um, so we'd look in there and make sure that it's clear and there's nothing in there occluding. If there was, then we're gonna have to get that stuff out. So we could have somebody help us roll this patient. We can scoop that out with our fingers or use our towel and, and get that stuff out of his airway and clear it. <clears throat> so we do this with our medical patients, the head tilt chin lift because we're worried about, or with our medical patients, we're not worried about spinal precautions. So we can manipulate the neck without injuring them, okay? So that's the first way. The second way is the jaw thrust. So at the jaw thrust maneuver, uh, these are our trauma patients. They're patients that have been uh, are injured, or we fear are injured, and we don't want to manipulate the back and neck. So we want to keep them in the position we found them in. We don't want to allow them to move or anything. And uh, it, like I said before, if they're partially responsive or unresponsive, uh, we'll just keep them laying in this position and then we're going to open their, open their airway with the jaw thrust. The way we're going to do that is basically we're going we're to put our hands on top of the face and we're going to grab under the jaw under this little arch back here. <clears throat> and we're going to lift forward a little bit. And all it does is pull the jaw forward just a couple of degrees. So it's just grabbing back here and pulling it forward a little bit. When we do that, it moves the jaw forward, which pulls that tongue forward up out of the airway also. And then we could have somebody else, if we have another person there, open the mouth or we might be able to do it at the same time and then we can look in there and make sure there isn't any vomit or secretions or anything in there that could be obscuring that airway. So uh, that's basically our, our two ways that the American Heart Association would like to see us open airways. And um, it can be very simple to get a person rebreathing again if they're not rebreathing. Many times, like I said before, it's, it's just a tongue falling back and occluding that airway. So that's it. In our series to save a life, uh, we're going to talk about the administration of the EpiPen. So EpiPen is used for uh, anaphylactic shock. And I think everybody understands that you know, anaphylaxis basically is um, allergic reactions. So um, to tell you a little bit of the history of allergic reactions, it all kind of started back in uh, 2641 BC. 
um, there was a pharaoh that got stung by a bee and uh, he developed difficulty breathing and suffocated and died. Uh, when this happened, they actually documented his death as being caused by the bee. So they think that this was one of the earliest documented cases of anaphylaxis. <clears throat> then in 1901, there were two scientists, Roche and Porter, and they were studying um, small jellyfish. They were, they were studying the toxins that are produced by jellyfish. And in their studies of the hypnotoxin uh, of these, they found that, that some dogs had a, a life-threatening reaction to them where they would develop difficulty breathing and suffocate and die. So Roche decides to study this reaction more and he um, starts to try to figure out what's going on in the body, why this is happening. In 1912, he comes up with the term anaphylaxis. And in 1913, he wins the Nobel Prize for his findings. He basically found that it was our own body just um, responding to a pathogen uh, wrong. So instead of our body trying to attack and kill the pathogen that gets into us, it over-responds and causes um, uh, more, more bad than good, basically. <laughs> so <clears throat> since then, since 1913, people have been studying this, this reaction more, trying to figure out why people are allergic to things. And there's still studies going on to this day about it. Um, they don't exactly understand you know, why, why some people are allergic to some things and others are not. So, and your, your allergies can change throughout life too. Just because you might have a, an allergic reaction to something now, doesn't mean you will in another 10 years, it can change. So, so when doctors see a patient that they think is gonna have a life-threatening reaction to something, like uh, for example, bees, uh, they'll give them an EpiPen to administer when they, when they could potentially be having that, that life-threatening reaction. So the EpiPen, is in basically an auto injector that was created by the military. And the military would put all sorts of different types of medication in these things. Um, for us, they put epinephrine in it. So <clears throat> um, the auto injector works very simply. It's going to inject through clothing. It can um, uh, inject through quite a bit of clothing, actually. And it, there's really no, no real thought we have to put into this thing. All we need to do is inject this into a muscle. So, so typically people who have, like I said, have a, a possible chance of having a life-threatening reaction to something are gonna carry these with them. And we can help them administer this if, uh, if need be. So the <clears throat> auto injector, the way this thing works is we're gonna grab it in a fist like this we don't want to grab it with our thumb over the back like that because uh, you can, you know, things can get a little exciting and in the heat of the moment, if we accidentally grab it this way, we could uh, inject ourselves with it. So we're going to grab it just in a fist and we're going to pull this cap off the back. It's kind of like a safety. And then we're going to inject the patient with it. So I'll show you how that works here in a minute. <clears throat> All right. So we got, got my buddy Lorenzo here again. And, uh, and let's just talk a little bit about some, some different types of reactions we can see with people. Um, people have all sorts of different grades of reactions and not all of them are life-threatening, okay? Some different things we can see is um, um, like flushing of the skin, uh, anxiety. Uh, we could even see hives pop up all around the body. And all these are, are not life-threatening. Um, we may even see some swelling in an extremity. Maybe they got stung by a bee in their arm and their whole arm swells up uh, or it just gets hives on that arm or across the whole body. So these are not life-threatening and uh, typically can be taken care of with just some Benadryl. Okay. The, the reactions that we're looking for that could possibly be life-threatening would be any kind of difficulty breathing. <clears throat> we might even hear the patient struggling to breathe. So they could, we could hear some, some um, like audible noises of their, of their breaths where they're struggling. You can hear <gasps> that type of sound. 
or even to, the patient starts to feel uh, faint, or maybe they do faint on us. With anaphylaxis, we can have um, issues in the lungs where it's starting to swell up and close up and make it difficult for them to move air in and out of the lungs. Or we can also see a drop in blood pressure. Okay, So if they start to feel faint or they're going to faint on us, uh, we could administer the EpiPen uh, along with that difficulty breathing. Okay. So when we see these life-threatening reactions, um, the patient can inject themselves with this on their own, or we can help them, okay? <clears throat> like I said, we're gonna inject into a muscle, and the best muscle to inject this into is a thigh, okay? A nice meaty thigh. So I got my buddy Lorenzo here, and, uh, and we'll say he's having difficulty breathing because he just got stung by a bee, okay? So <clears throat> I'm gonna find the location where, where I wanna inject him, and I'm gonna find a nice meaty spot on the thigh there, Going to hold the EpiPen in the fist, like we said, and pull the cap off the back. Now this thing is live and ready to go, so we got to be extra cautious with it. <clears throat> we'll take the EpiPen and we're going to hold it to the body where we want to inject. We don't need to swing or anything like they do on TV. <laughs> we're just going to hold it to the body and give it a push. When we give it a push, we're going to hear a click. Once we hear the click, we're going to count to 10 and then we can pull it out, okay? So, I'm gonna hold it to the body, gonna give it a push, listen for the click, count to 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and then I can pull it out, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, that's basically how we're gonna administer this. Also, don't forget to call 911. <laughs> Uh, with allergic reactions, they can still come back even after administering the EpiPen. Sometimes this doesn't fix it. Sometimes it can just stop it from progressing uh, for a little while. It also doesn't last very long in the body. It only lasts about three to five minutes. So if it's going to work, we're going to see, see uh, things progress uh, positively fairly quickly, within about a minute. Um, but then we could see our patient potentially degrade again after five minutes. So we would want to call 911 and get them coming in our direction. Um, <clears throat> anytime we, we are not sure about what to do, we should be calling 911. And we'll be talking about that in another episode too. So, okay. That's all I got for you. Okay, in our series of uh, how to save a life, we're going to talk about uh, using the AED. Okay, so the American Heart Association has uh, determined that uh, early defibrillation for cardiac arrest patients is one of the most uh, crucial things we can do along with CPR. So they want us to use the AED, which stands for Automatic External Defibrillator. Okay, and we see these AEDs all around the community. You know, they're in quite a few of the churches, they're in the schools, um, they're in each police car. Uh, we see them you know, quite a few places around town. So, uh, here, I'll just pull this one out, <clears throat> and we'll just talk about the AED a little bit. So, there's many different types of AEDs out there, but they all do exactly the same thing. This one, you know, is blue and kind of bulky. There's other ones that are big and green and small and red, and it, and it doesn't really matter what they look like. Uh, they all do exactly the same thing, okay? They're very simple to use. Uh, anybody can use one of these. Uh, it, they will talk to you, they have pictures, and uh, they're gonna walk you through exactly what you need to do. The big thing is gonna be getting this thing to the scene of a cardiac arrest patient and getting it administered quickly. American Heart Association really wants us to have this on our cardiac arrest patients within the first 10 minutes of arrest, okay? After 10 minutes, uh, their odds of survival start to drop drastically. So we need to get this on quickly. We need to have early defibrillation, okay? <clears throat> we'll just set that there. So in a typical scenario, our patient would be in cardiac arrest and somebody would be doing CPR on them. Uh, at this point, we would want someone to go find the AED and bring it to the scene. 
once they get it to the scene, uh, we're going to have them put it on, place it on the patient, or we'd want to see them place it on the patient. With the AED, there's typically some other stuff in the bag with it. There'll be a little pouch, and in that little pouch, there'll be uh, uh, trauma shears that'll look like this, which um, trauma shears are kind of funny looking. They look like a cheap piece of junk stamped out of steel scissors, but these things are extremely strong. They'll actually cut a penny in half. So that we can cut the clothing off the patient and expose their chest so we can hook this onto their chest. So there'll be a trauma shears, there'll be a shaver, and there'll be some gloves in there too, okay? So we'd want to put the gloves on and then while somebody's doing CPR, we're going to expose the chest so we can see where the pads need to go on the body. So we would take our, our trauma shears and we would cut that clothing off and expose the chest. <clears throat> we're going to want to cut all the clothing off too. We need to expose the chest so we can see, see skin and, uh, and see where we need to apply the pads. <clears throat> then we just look at this thing. It's got pictures. It shows uh, one pad placed in the upper right and one pad placed on the lower left. So we'll look at those locations on our patient and see if there's anything there because we need to have these pads connected to good dry skin. So we'll look and we can feel even and make sure there's nothing there. So hair could be a problem. If the patient is uh, extremely hairy, I, I typically tell people in class, if you get their chest exposed and they look like Robin Williams, uh, we're gonna have to do some, do some mowing. So, <laughs> so we'll take the little shaver and we can shave a couple of spots to get, get a uh, connection to the skin. Uh, surprisingly, the pads are very sticky and they can adhere to quite a bit of, of hair. So they need to be extremely hairy in order for us to take that time to shave a little bit of it off. And it doesn't have to be perfectly shaved, you know, down to bare. We just, we're trying to knock it down so these can stick, okay? We'll look for medication patches. If we see any medication patches that are directly where the pads are going to go, we can remove those patches and get them out of the way. If they're not in our way, we're not going to take them off the body. We would leave them right there. <clears throat> uh, piercings are typically not a problem unless they're in our way again for the pad placement. Um, internal devices like internal defibrillators, internal pacemakers are typically in the upper left and typically out of our way, but sometimes they end up on the upper right and in our way. And in that case, you know, we'll see this lump under the skin with maybe a scar. You'll be able to touch it and feel that there's a device under the skin. At that point, when we put our pads on, we don't want to put them directly on top of that device. We're going to move the pad down about an inch off of that device, okay? So uh, when we take these pads out and place them on the body, we just need to make sure we have good good connection to the skin. So if they're really sweaty too, that might be an issue. Obviously these aren't going to stick too, too great to the body if, if they're sweaty, so we could dry them off a little bit <clears throat> and have good clean connection. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll just show you how this operates. As soon as I open this one up, it's going to start talking and it's going to tell me everything it wants me to do. Some devices you have to push the on button to get it to turn on and, and talk to you. This one's all automatic, okay? So, <clears throat> so ideally we have somebody doing CPR right now and I'm just operating the AED. Begin by removing all clothing from the patient's chest. Cut clothing if needed. So there we can take that clothing off, get the chest exposed. When patient's chest is bare, remove protective cover and take out white adhesive pads. So we take the pads out like Look it asked. Look carefully at the pictures on the white adhesive pads. Pads have Feel pictures. Pad from the yellow plastic have pictures liner. on them. So we just look at the pictures place and we add exactly as shown in the picture. And we place Press it right where it's shown. So fair skin. And we, again, we want to make sure there's nothing there to obscure it from the good clean skin. When the first pad is in place, so it's got the other look picture. Carefully at the picture on the second pad. Peel the second pad. No one should touch the patient. At this point, we would stop CPR and, and not touch the patient and let the AED do its job. No one should touch the patient. Shock advised. 
stay clear of patient. Press the flashing orange button now. I'll make sure nobody's touching. Clear. Deliver and shock now. Shock we can delivered. Shock. Be sure emergency medical services have been called. It is safe to touch the patient. Begin CPR. And we can or go back into CPR. CPR. Okay. Press the flashing blue button. Now, this one had a little extra feature. It said to push the flashing blue button uh, if you need help with CPR. And basically, it's going to walk me through everything. It'll tell you hand placement. It'll give you a beat to follow. It'll talk you through everything. So <clears throat> the AED, you can see, is very simple to operate. Uh, it talks you through everything that you need to do. So there's really uh, you know, nothing to fear when using one of these. Um, it's, it, uh, it's looking for some very specific rhythms to try to convert and get this patient um, moving blood again on their own. So <clears throat> it may or may not shock, depending on what it finds. If it advises not to shock, it'll tell you to go back into CPR and continue CPR. If it advises to shock, like it did for us, we'll shock them and then we'll go right back into CPR and we'll continue CPR. So we're going to continue doing this until help arrives. So um, it's going to talk us through everything. It's going to um, tell us what we need to do. And every two minutes, this thing is going to reanalyze this patient. So as we're doing our CPR and things are progressing two minutes from now, this is going to stop us and it's going to reanalyze the patient and it's going to advise the shock or not shock again. And it's just going to keep on going. Okay. So um, that's our basic AED use. It's a um, very simple device to use and um, hopefully you never have to use it. Well, those were pretty easy, pretty focused, pretty specific things that you uh, covered during your demonstration. Mm -hmm. But again, the idea is easy. Easy yes. for people to understand it, easy for people to do it, mm -hmm. and also the things that are going to really make a difference when it comes to uh, impacting someone who has an allergic reaction, someone who's become unconscious, mm -hmm. or someone who needs the use of an external defibrillator because of a cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. um, just that was a wonderful coverage of that information. Thank you.